I well, really appreciate all the hard work that our sound and worship team put together um, each and every week, but they're doing extra time uh, as they're putting this together, and ultimately we'll be getting lights, new lights, and up in here, and then eventually to the back, and all that is going on with that, that will be fantastic. Please open your Bible to Genesis chapter 36, and this is the passage of Scripture that... Um, Rob was alluding to last week when he talked about how it can get interesting uh, in the area of the names. And so you pray for me as I work through these names together uh, with you. And, uh, but if you can have an idea that genealogies, it's kind of like a phone book a little bit in the fact that um, if we don't know people, it only means so much. I mean, a phone book means only so much when we're looking for something. I don't know how many of you... Um, take the time and go, you know what, this morning I just feel moved to read the phone book, you know, and uh, to go down through it, or like on the jerk, the movie The Jerk, where he finally is somebody because he sees his name in here. Um, but this is just, this is just the greater St. Charles region. Um, when we were little, and the, the, the Chicago phone book really got you high at the dinner table as a child. I want you to know that. Um, that, was, that was the goal, not high, getting high as... You sat higher. It wasn't, you didn't smoke it. Um, anyways, like I have to explain this to you. But So if you can get the idea that as we're working through this together, that you'd have an appreciation of the fact that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And as we look at these verses and as we're seeing it, God's got a reason. I remember one of the messages that I preached early on in Genesis, and I, the title of the message was Boring for a Reason. And it was one of those things that was kind of interesting when I looked later as I put the podcast up, my face appeared in the sermon audio thing and underneath it said, boring for a reason. <laughs> and, and Rob was more than willing to share. You know, that was kind of appropriate that you had that that way. Um, so today's message is entitled, We Built This City because um, I wanted you, us, as we're working through this, we start to see how the world views things. I would venture to say that this is probably a passage of scripture that maybe we're the only church in North America that's going through this this morning. This is one of those that's usually skipped, I would think, Uh, because you move right from um, Jacob and all that he's been doing with Bethel, and you move him uh, into the Joseph story, which actually we won't start next week. We're going to do a series on Christology leading up to Good Friday and Easter and then a little beyond that to the ministry of, of Christ. But I want you to have an understanding that when he puts genealogies in here, he's not wasting words. He's giving us details. Our job with the hermeneutic or the interpretation of it is what God are you trying to teach and what is the, what is the gospel in this? What is the good news in this? Because Jesus, when he was on the road to Emmaus, you remember that after his crucifixion, and he appears to those disciples, those two disciples, on the road to Emmaus, he was able to go through the law, which is what we're in right now, the first five books of Moses, through the prophets, and he would show himself. And so I want to point you back to a little bit of what I saw, remember, growing up. There were times when I'd be with friends and you'd be, and they'd, in their room they had street signs. I don't know if you've ever had that. Those things are very durable, very strong. I, I, they always seem to have them. I don't know how they showed up in their rooms. You, they may have borrowed them from some sign on the street. But this one was in some guy's rooms, and it was this, the, the dead end sign. Okay, it's very appropriate that it's in front of a a cemetery. Um, But these are important. They don't have the city, the county, whoever puts these up, they don't put these up like they don't have a sign that says Mark's house. That's durable and they put it on. You usually have to describe in street signs and ultimately they get to our house and they have an address. But these are different places. They have this as stop. They have its dead end or they have the one where the kids, you know, the silhouette of the kids walking. And so you have an understanding as you're working through your driver's ed tech test that, um, that these signs are important and they're durable. And the paint on them, it's like they can, it can go through nuclear. I mean, it's just like really strong signs. And, and we read them and we have to say to ourselves, it is important. There's some reason why this is put here. 
And I need to heed this. Because it would help me to do that. But there's times, like that sign in particular, not for that place, but just the dead end sign. I don't know if you've had that, where just when I first moved to Warrington, and I was still trying to figure out the drive, whether it be to uh, the Chesterfield area or into the city, or even just um, on, the, on 70. Um, and I would, you know, like things pile up, and I, they haven't been doing this as much lately, but I remember when things would pile up, it seemed like everybody and their mother would go off onto the grass and onto the frontage road. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't see many people doing it as much as they, they used to. But those frontage roads, those, those roads that are alongside, whether it be the north side or the south side of I-70, or when you go down toward Chesterfield and you have the, um, um, is it Wingate? The, the, that area there near the, near the theater, um, all those different things. And as like N and all those highway or those, um, those roads that are there, there have been times where I'm in a hurry. And I want to get to another spot quickly. I want to get back home. I want to, I want to make my way over to um, St. Joe's West or something. You see traffic, and you're like, oh, okay, I got this figured out. I'll get off here, and I'll start riding along the highway, and there will be a sign that says dead end. And I'll think to myself, yeah, I know it says dead end. I know it says dead end, but you know what? I'm smarter and I'll find a way. If I go along this way, and I, uh, has anybody else done that? I, uh, let's con- true confession. Yes, I'm a dead end addict, you know. Um, and so I'm, I would drive down that, and it may not show up for a while. And I'm thinking, they lied. They didn't want me to go through their town. They had this figured out. And so I would just keep driving. And then at a certain point, guess what? Dead end. I should have heeded that. I should, and it's and the farther I go in it, that I'm thinking, this is so cool. Is the farther I got to go back? And so, there is an element of this chapter this morning that God is saying to you and me, and He's putting a big on this boring for a reason chapter. Dead end. It may even appear that there's some great things in this. But the end of it is nothing. Because this is the genealogy of the Edomite. This is the genealogy of Esau's family. And I don't know how many of you know any Edomites right now. But there's another family that God centers his, his focus on, and that's the family, the people of Israel. And I know a few Jews, and I know true Jews, sons and daughters of Abraham, that started out, and they weren't as cool as this, these, this family. So let's, let's uh, have I prayed yet? Uh, you can never pray too much. Let's pray, let's pray. Father, thank you. I ask you, God, that as we're looking at this, then, Lord, you just help us that we'd, that we'd have an understanding of dead-end roads and roads that leave to, lead to life everlasting, roads that make a difference. And so, Father, would you help us with this this morning? We really need your eyes and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. God says, in fact, Jesus wants us to think long-term. You look at this passage here in John 15. This is just before... He, um, he's going to be crucified. It's, it's around the time he's doing um, his, the Last Supper. Look at this. He says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I've heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Look at this. 
and that your fruit should abide or your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. So he doesn't want us to just think me, my kids, my grandkids. He wants me to think me, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, down the line, further, 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 and think, what is my impact? I mean, he, in the Word, he talks about this constantly. He'll even talk about our sins visited to the third and fourth generation. And so it's his way of going, I just want you to know how you're living now has ramifications for lives beyond you. And so think about that. Think about your attitudes. Think about how you talk. Think about how you think. Think about all of those things and what are you passing along as you go. And, and instead of going, oh, if I can just get them through school, if I can just get them married, if I can just get my grandkid through this, if I can just, and then I'm going to die. Then I'm done. When I'm done, I'm done. I'm out. All right. And he's going, I don't want you to think that. I want you to think long term. God, how is my life doing with this? And how I define success needs to be different than what everybody else seems to define success as. If you want to live the life of Esau and his descendants, then just do this. Just be normal. And you're like, I love normal. But he's called us to more. Just normal is, I do what everybody else does. I make money. I'm a good guy. I mow my lawn. You're, some of you are saying, I don't know a lot of people that call themselves normal. They should mow their lawn a little bit better than they do. All right? um, I should do this. I should do that. And it's everything that the world does. You just, you just think that way. Like when, like, I'll just give an example. When Janet Dern came up here last week, and she was giving an announcement. Now, many of you weren't here because um, it had snowed, and you were like, I'm not going out in that. But what she said, she wants to work on a ministry so that when people come to our church, that there are different age groups of people that, that when you see a new person, you don't pounce on them, but that you have this understanding, you know what, I'm around their age, and I have an understanding of, of what's going on at our church and the different ministries that are available and stuff like that. I will make an effort to go over to this person and talk. And I don't know how many, I know she has one person that, is, um, that went up to her and you know, you have time and you can talk to her a little bit more about that. But I was wondering, if, if at all, if somebody gets up and they make an announcement, it could be different things concerning the Lord. Is there ever a time when you go, yeah, I could do that in the power of Christ? Or these people are up here and it could be like they're the adult in the peanut, um, peanut you know, comic book strip that was actually in a movie. It's not the kind of... You, but you, when they're talking, you hear... And they're just getting through it. It never occurs to you to think ministry. Which, by the way, should be like a red flag. In anything. You're just... I'm just and, but at least I'm here. Great. But he's called us to more. We're not called just to be... I just want to be normal. He's saying, actually, I've called you to more than that. I, I want something. And so whatever that is, however he's wired you, your strengths, your understanding of, of giftedness or where your passion and things along the line, that you'd go, God, where you've wired me, I want to, a hundred years from now, I want it when it's all said and done. That thing mattered. What I did, that mattered there. And that's that long-term thinking that I don't think Esau was thinking because Esau, when he started out, in fact, let's look at these first five verses here. And this is where you pray for me because these names get interesting, okay? These are the generations of Esau, verse 1 of chapter 36. That is Edom. Remember, he got the name. He's also called Edom. That means red or red dirt. 
because we get the name Adam from that. He was made out of the dirt, the dust of the ground. And so, I remember Edom, he was also the one that when he, his brother was making that pot of stew, and he was a man driven by his, his passions, driven by his senses, driven by his appetites. And he comes by and he goes, oh, you got to give that to me. Uh, if you don't give me that, I'm going to die. Well, if you, if you just give me your birthright, I might give you some of this. Oh, man, it won't do me any good if I'm dead. Yeah, give it to me. Who cares? The birthright's birthright. Okay. And he eats it, and that takes it. That's Edom. Okay. These are the generations of Esau that is Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites. Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. I'm going to say this name a lot, so I'm just going to make it as easy as possible. Oh, holy Alabama. All right. This is, a, this is a woman for Derek Forsyth. Oh, holy Alabama. Okay. He's such an Alabama fan. Okay. The, <laughs> the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebioth, and Ada bore to Esau, Eliphaz, Basemath, bore Ruel, and holy Alabama, bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. So we've got Harry Esau, Guy, love, seems to love the ladies. Um, he's, he's got this short-term gratification thing going on. Look at the names of Esau's wives here. Ada means ornament or the adorned one. Oholabama means tent height or tall and stately. Basemath means the perfumed one. It seems, you've got to be careful about this, but it seems that each name focused on some outward beauty or sensuality. He loved the ladies. And he took wives from the Canaanites. That was something that God did not want them to do, but he didn't care because Esau seemed to be this guy. You aren't going to tell me what to do. I don't know if you've ever met people like this. You aren't going to tell me what to do. And you know why people do what these things that they do? Here's why they do it. Because they can. That's why. There's certain things you'll see on the news and you go, why, why are they doing that? Because they can. And Esau was one of those guys. You could imagine what he must have been like as a little one growing up. Strong-willed, and he's going to do whatever. And out of these unions came five sons, and they're born leaders. They're strong. Eighty-one names are mentioned in this line, and only two hint of a belief in the true God. Reuel means friend of God, and Jeush means the Lord helps. And he sought, it seems... He sought success by the world standards. And that's what he was looking for with his kids. That's what he pushed. Never discussions, it seems, of depth in the area of getting to the heart. Busyness. Handling things. Do, and by the way, it's good. Things have to get done. But every now and then, dad needs to sit down and have a heart-to-heart and have quality conversations. He's called us to that, men. And yes, that is harder. But it seems that every time in the scriptures when there is a man that does not step up and is willing to have those kind of conversations, what happens? And so down the road. And it's a beautiful and successful family by the world's standards, but it doesn't equal a family blessed by God. And let's quit excusing things and, and let's quit putting aside and say to myself, and this is because this is the word of the Lord, God, I don't want to be Esau. And if I've been Esau-like, if I've lived the life of the Edomite, that, Father, you'd help me now, that you'd help me now. Look at verses 6 through 8. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went into a land away from his brother Jacob, for their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. 
The land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. Esau had become a very wealthy man. He at one time was an angry man, even thinking about killing his brother, if you can remember that. He later became, and I think sometimes just with age, we become, we become, become more docile. We become, we, we're tired. I don't want to fight everybody. And he seemed to be gracious and forgiving. In fact, it was very humbling how he responded to Jacob's acknowledgement and confession and, and asking for forgiveness. And that's great, but he had become materials, materially prosperous, but did that guarantee spiritual prosperity? God has called us to more. But he also says to us, I think in the words, and we'll see this in this Luke passage here that we're going to look at, that God is saying, I want you to also watch how the unsaved, how the unbeliever, how those that are lost value things. Let's look at this. This is a a passage from Luke chapter 16. He also said to the disciples, he's trying to teach, and he goes, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be my manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am removed from the management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write down 80. What's happening with this guy, by the way, as the scripture is um, changing here in a moment, is he, he's going to get fired. And so what he does is he goes around to the people that, his, that owe his master money and he's getting money for himself that was supposed to go to his master at a discounted rate and he's going to cover himself. And he says, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unri- unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. What's hap- what happened was, and Jesus is trying to basically say to him, say to them, Watch how these people that are not believers deal with things. They're really smart. He'll do this regularly. Jesus would do this regularly. He goes, I want you to look at how the Gentiles do things. We're not supposed to do things like them. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But I want you to have an understanding. They're not stupid. They get rich and God, by common grace, you'll, you'll see sometimes where people are going, man, they live this way and they live that way. Why do they get away with stuff? God's gracious. Do you realize for the unbeliever, this is the closest to heaven they will ever be if they don't turn and receive Christ. This is heaven for them. And by the way, this is the closest to hell that we will ever be. And so we watch those in the world, and what he's saying is, that guy's no dummy what he's doing. Is it wrong that he's doing? Yeah, he calls them dishonest. He, call, he has different adjectives that he describes them, but he goes, I want you to do this. Here's what I want you to do. In a godly way, I want you to think toward what am I investing in? Because this guy's thinking, "How I don't want to dig. I don't want to do this stuff. I'll do this, and this will cover me for that time. And he's saying, that's... That's just for the earth. He's saying when you and I look at life, we look at people and what we're investing in, God wants us to leverage that for eternity. He wants us to think, how is the way I'm living, how is that the best thing for eternity? And so he uses that as an example. Second point, looking at his progeny. Point number one was looking at his persons. Point number two, if you're taking notes, looking at his progeny. Look at verses 9 through 19. 
These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomite in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau, Reu, the son of Basemath, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gadam, and Kenaz. Timna was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Reu, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the sons of Basemath. Esau's wife. These are the sons of Olhalbama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. She bore to Esau, Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs. Notice that word. These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chiefs, Teman, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. You've heard that name before. These are the, and by the way, that word Amalek and that name and his descendants made life interesting for the children of Israel. These are the chiefs of Eliphaz, and interesting's bad. Chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Ada. These are the sons of Rael, Esau's son, the chiefs, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the chiefs of Rael in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Basemath, Esau's wife. The, these are the sons of Olabama, Esau's wife, the chiefs, Jehush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs born to Hol- Holabama, the daughter of Anna, Easter, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau. That is Edom, and these are their chiefs. We see a list of what the Bible calls chiefs, those with political power. You, you have to believe that Esau was extremely proud of these guys. He and his children, they're, they're socially successful. And it's a dead end. If God is not in it, it is a dead end. Point number three, looking at his predecessors. Look at verse 20. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land. Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Horai and Hemam, and Lotan's sister was Timna. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvin. <laughs> Never mind. Manahath, Ebal, Shebo, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion, Ai, and Ana. He is the Anna. Now look at this. It's like he stops. He is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of Zibion, his father. Isn't that important to know? But I almost feel like he's stopping and going, this guy had a jacuzzi. These are the children of Anna, Dishan, and Ohalabama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishan, Hemdan, Ishban, Ithran, and Sharon. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhan, Zavan, and Achan. These are the sons of Dishan, Uz, and Aaron. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the chiefs, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishan, Ezer and Dishan, these are the chiefs of the Horites, chief by chief in the land of Seir. And at the time, it would have been, they would have been on the county buildings. They would have been in those buildings. You ever see that when a building is built and you walk in and it was dedicated and you see the name like in our um, post office? Who was president when it was put up? And the important people that had the postmaster general and things along. And then we have our local um, Buildings that have dedications and they'll have names of whether it be the construction person or it be certain officials and it's important. And at the time, it's like, this is so great. And they're going to cut this tape and everybody's, oh, it's so great. And then years later, you and I just walk by it. We don't know. If somebody stops, hey, just so you know, this is really, this person, I'm related to him. The only reason it's dear to us is because we're related to him. And we read this and it's just like reading a phone book. And we look at it and we go, but what does this have to do with way down here? But we've got a book full of people that weren't necessarily chiefs, weren't kings, shepherds. And they were sustained. 
And they weren't perfect people, messed up people. You know we've been working through these passages where we just literally go, seriously. But God, but God, graciously moving. The Horites were the original inhabitants of the land that Esau was making his own. The name Horite comes from the word meaning a hole or a cave. Seir's descendants, listed here, numbered seven sons and one daughter. And studying these individuals, we find a pagan family through and through. Just be normal. Just, just don't, marry, don't worry about marrying a believer. It's no big deal. I can marry anybody. It won't affect me. And it will. It will. Getting married interculturally is never a problem with God, ever. It's interfaith that's the issue. Point four, looking at his preeminence. Looking at his preeminence. Verse 31, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, the name of his city being Din Haba. Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his place. Jobab died, and Husham of the land of the Temanites reigned in his place. Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in the county of Moab, reigned in his place, the name of his city being Avith. Hadad died, and Samla of Basraka reigned in his place. Samla died, and Shoal of Rehoboth on the Euphrates reigned in his place. Shal died, and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his place. Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hadar reigned in his place, the name of his city being Pa. His wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matrid, daughter of Mezahab. Sandwich in this genealogical details is a statement that points to the kingship of Israel. And this list, if you notice, isn't necessarily sons coming on. It's different. Somebody, com- somebody dies and somebody comes in and takes over as king. There's no dynasty. And it's a rule of people over a people more than a, a tribal group. Last few verses, verse 40 through 43. These are the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their clans and their dwelling places. By their names, the chiefs Timna, Alva, Jetheth, Olabama, Ella, Pinan, Canez, Timon, Mibzar, Magdiel, and Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom. That is, Esau, the father of Edom, according to their dwelling place, places in the land of their possession. Have you noticed that he keeps beating a drum about the fact that this is Esau? And then you'll see in parentheses, he goes, and that is Edom. Moses knows by the Spirit of God that ultimately we're going to come to a book in the future called Obadiah, smallest book in the Old Testament. And it's a prophecy against the Edomite. And they, they were so proud. They were so proud of living in a place that they felt was completely secluded and away from everybody. And there's no way they could be conquered. And ultimately they got conquered because their pride was the case. And so I want to I encourage you and challenge you that there may be times where you're discouraged. You look around and you see, you go, Man, I'm, I, I'm getting to church. I'm giving I seem, I'm trying hard. It just, it seems frustrating because it seems like other people seem to be so successful. They see, everybody seems to be doing well and they're doing well without even caring about what God thinks. And one time there was a psalmist, a guy writing songs who was just as frustrated. And so as we wrap up this morning, I'd like to work through this song together. And this is almost like that. Um, it's a, it's a song that, we can stop and reflect on the words and think to ourselves, that really tells a good story. And, and that's, that's my prayer and that's my hope, that our understanding of things is, God, I want to be godly. I don't want to just be normal. 
I don't want what, just what the world has. I just want to be happy. That will only last so long as opposed to, God, I want to be holy. And, I, and I, want, I want when it's all said and done, when my kids think about me or my grandkids think about me, when they look back, it was that person loved God and they loved me. Let's look at this. Asaph writes this. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And this is how he felt. He said, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs unto death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're, they're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. This is the guy sitting there and going, I, I treat a girl really well, but man, it's like they always date the losers. Why? I, I just should be like, don't be that guy. For all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Look at this. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. For they have no pangs unto death. They are good. <laughs> She's so patient with me. Let's wrap up on this verse. I like this, actually. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. This is God's calling on our life. Let's not get our eyes looking around and seeing all of the Edomites, seeing all those of Esau and saying, boy, they seem to have it all together. Their kid makes varsity. Mine always makes JV. Their, their kid is getting the best grades. Mine's just, it's all they can do to struggle through stuff. And by the way, obviously as Christians, let's get the best grades, Okay. But our, we want our ideas and our thoughts and our hearts to be so tied to what the Word says and to have an understanding, God, I want to be a son of Abraham, um, a true child of yours. And God, would you help me think long term? Would you help when I think of success, when I think of how you view things, God, I'd ask you, Lord, that I would not think so temporal, but think, God, what is, what is this bad thing that I'm doing and the ramifications of it and this good thing? And God, God, please do your work. Do your work. So that when it's all said and done, if they were to look at a genealogy, the things that would be said would not be, yeah, they, they were the ones who uh, discovered the jacuzzi but they were the ones that sought God. Like Enoch, he walked with God and then he was no more. Let's pray. Father, I ask you, God, that you would just help us at this time as we desire to be people 
that walk with you, that trust you, that, that um, have your eyesight and your understanding of how things should be. And Father, do this for the glory of Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.